Welcome to Debt to Cinema. I'm Stephen Maltmanex. And I'm Brian Gillis. Like most people, we love going to the theater and catching latest releases. However, you can sadly put a big dent in your wallet. Fortunately, living in the digital age makes the viewing possibilities endless from the comforts of home. Many of these films that you can see right from your couch, we're ashamed to say we miss, despite labeling ourselves cinephiles. So join us as one or both of us cross off a title from our list of shame. It can be an all-time essential classic. Or an underrated piece of cinema that's worth giving a shot. Hell. It might just be some trashy film we want the other's opinion on. So sit tight and join us as we pay off our debts, one dollar at a time. There's an intimacy involved in playing existence that is beyond description. They just pop your spine with a little hydro gun. Break out of your cage, Paco. I haven't crippled anyone yet. Step into my office. Now I'm warning you going to be a wild ride don't call it a comeback <laughs> that's what i got man the planning is uh stole mine. It's, it's not the same <laughs> you stole my this joke is what you went with twitter joke yeah I, I mean i know you're not on on the twitter i didn't look anymore. at your twitter but this was honestly what was just coming to mind when i facebooked you that one time and i was like you know what i'm not calling this a revival you know it's it's not a comeback or anything i'm here man let's do this it's just the thing it's actually really funny because I was feeling a little vain before you um, you contacted me because I, I have like a, a Google Home type mm-hmm. smart speaker whatever alarm clock and I found out that you could like voice request podcast episodes. I got into this show called Heavily Pixelated about like video games and how they help you emotionally through t- like stuff and so I was like, oh, you, you can say that by name and so I was like, I wonder... If I said, hey, you know, like, play the latest episode of Dollar Reviews <laughs> podcast, if that would work, and sure as fucking shit, it did. You know, it, it played the Eraserhead episode, and I was like, whoa, and I actually had a girl over when that happened. She's like, "Why are, are we listening to you? I was like, shut up, just let me let me, let me, me zone out here, and then it was like two days later that you contacted me. It was pretty That's funny. That's got to be an off-putting one to start with. Or I, I, I have not gone back to it, but... I, you know, like just that exit, that was a weird time for me just because yeah, no. for the past year without getting too detailed, but I've been in a reboot phase where, you know, my mentality of keeping busy and doing everything I can, uh, lack of sleep just finally caught up with me at a certain point. We were burning the candle on both ends. Like when people ask me like, oh, didn't you do a podcast or do you still do that? And it's like, I did two, three, four episodes a week. For a long period of time, we didn't take any breaks. Like, you, you want to know what a real job is? Because it was like slave labor for a while there. It was fun. And then it wasn't fun. And that's fun to think about but, it. But, uh, I mean, essentially, yeah, what happened was that I just, I saw that the Existence screening was coming up. And immediately I remembered you saying that was your favorite Cronenberg flick. And mm-hmm. I just wanted to be sure. But I went back to the episode and I was like, I, it wasn't exactly a bet. In my mind it was. But... I, I feel like we, I, I kept talking about the possibility of like, yeah, I, I feel confident that I could get a screening and you just went, nah, nah, it's not going to happen. I still feel that way. I mean, I know you got one, but I'm thinking about happened. it in retrospect. Was, was it a packed house, please? Yes. It was a packed house. It Perfect. was a new year, man. Yeah. I mean, it's almost 20 years the day that it came out too, roughly. I saw this uh, tweet literally like, you know, two hours before we started doing this thing. Amy Nicholson was posting a story that she wrote not a story but you know like a expose on 1999 the one of the best cinematic years of modern filmmaking you know and everything changed and she lists a whole bunch of films because 99 is a deep year the sixth sense the matrix magnolia eyes wide shut um, yeah there's the iron giant there's so, fight so club yeah. uh, i mean no it's a big year big filmmaker year like you know all of these masters um and i'm looking through this thing and no there's no cronenberg mentioned there is there, there's no existence mentioned, and it just kind of reinforced my idea that this is Cronenberg's, like, unknown masterpiece. Yes, The Fly is amazing. We got an episode on that. Yes, Videodrome is amazing, you know? Well, maybe not in my humble opinion. Uh, and, you know, his more recent films, uh, with the exception, perhaps, of uh, A Dangerous Method, you know, looking at A History of Violence and looking at Eastern Promises, where is he? Like, I want him to put out something this year, you know? <laughs> this one was one of the earlier ones I saw, just on cable, maybe like 2005, 2006 type thing. And even though I hadn't seen it in 10 plus years, 
I remembered every single fucking beat. Like, I watched it yesterday. And you know, when that happens to you, when your, like, filmic brain just doesn't forget the sequences, maybe not remember all the dialogue, but all of the big booms, that it, there's a reason for that. I already told you in the past, you, you remembered from the Fly episode, I'm sure mm -hmm. other things as well. What, what was your experience like? How, how'd you leave it? How'd you take it? Is, is it still a simulation? I mean, I walked out and my immediate reaction is I got to message Brian and talk about doing <laughs> this. So that should be telling enough. I but you're so, not yeah. alone in thinking that this is one of or maybe Cronenberg's masterpiece. Because, I mean, that was basically how this screening started was mm -hmm. basically built up as this great film that was more or less kind of forgotten. So I went in with an open mind completely, and right away I could see why this was sort of forgotten and how I think in a modern context it might play better than it did in 1999, because right off the bat, it's very surreal. Like, you know, the acting is just kind of wooden by design. It's pretty off, you know, which I think just for the sake of taste culturally, or at least there's an entire film... Uh, audience out there now that knows how to embrace this kind of stuff do you know what i oh, mean yeah it's funny too because even though this one is under the radar and most cronenberg's work is this is on hulu right now i watch this i got i got like a premium account nowadays it's right there i didn't even have to search for it it was like newly added i was like holy fucking shit i added it to my list just days before you know you contacted me timing, yeah. yeah no it was just kind of surreal kind of weird i'm not alone here i think you'll agree this is kind of a sequel to, to Videodrome. Uh, spiritually, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know about sequel, but definitely not, like, not an a extension. true sequel, Just but yeah. Thematically, it's... on like what it is, although I think this one is far more dense and far more groundbreaking, and I think more cerebral. Videodrome, it, it's more singular in that it's criticism of media specifically, but well, it's actually tape. More just, yeah, on the moving image itself. Mm -hmm. This is. The interactive just image. A, yeah, it's more interactive. It's And there's a lot more to it. I mean, I can specify it on the end, but this movie was pretty dead on on its portrayal of the cell phone or the tablet, what have you. The pink phone. <laughs> at, at the end specifically, where I saw that, I was like, Hold, this is 1999, and they don't have this yet, and this is exactly how people react to this right now, where they're just staring uh -huh. down at this screen, you know, waiting for something, or if people are just waiting at a room. They're not talking to each other that's just one of the things at the end that burns. I don't want to get to the ending yet because there's a yeah, yeah. lot to talk about there. But, you know, Videodrome doesn't have any of that. Well, it's just it's a different era. It's the early 80s. Um, the only big thing back then, you know, in specifics to that film, you know, is like pirate TV and these snuff tapes and the VCR just come out. It wasn't just about what you could catch live, but the fact that you could record it, you can watch it whenever. It didn't matter how bad it was. You know, you could do a mail order, get it, watch it. It was literally, you know, to use our own words, ingesting media, consuming it. Like when James Woods has that chest VHS, like, crevice you know and he, he shoves the tape literally in his body as he needs it he lives off it he's eating it um and to go from just food and mouth or you know like uh, male female ends or whatever like oh yeah i got fucked by it you jump to this where it's like we're fucking each other it's like how does it start? We're sitting in this room. We're going to interact with this game pod. We're all going to tether in. Um, like, we're literally going to be... It's literally the intimacy with it, where yeah. the game pod is, you know, it a is living sexualized. Creature. The analog, like, a stick, mm -hmm. it's literally a nipple. It's an umbilical cord. Like, you have you have this socket or this crevice, a biopod, you know, and it, it's, it's and very body the, uh, mm -hmm. the port, what's with the, it called, the... XE60, aka WD40. Yeah. But just, you know, it starts in this manner that I don't think any kind of Cronenberg film, uh, with the exception of The Fly, because that one, one is more recent films, um, is so not necessarily straight laced, but, uh, you know, kind of paint by numbers. It, it's, it, it's taking you on this ride. It was supposed to be not a blockbuster, but uh, a wide scope. Um, and this despite how weird it gets or fantastic uh, towards about the middle there, it, it's kind of the same way. Like it has a very slow dip into this world or these worlds or these environments or whatever it is, you know, these, these uh, antenna experiences or pilgrimage experiment experiences or cortical systematics. 
where you know I'm I'm very into this kind of thing. It, it was a big reason why we did Strange Days, but then even before that, it's just like a, you know a personal fan, obviously of like Total Recall or the Thirteenth Floor, or, you know, notably 1999, The Matrix. Well, the effect is a little different here. I mean, mm-hmm. I think compared to those, like or even something like The Fly, when you're watching it as it goes along, you're curious to see where it's going. Oh, I meant in terms of the the um the nature of this uh, interactive world that you're taking place in that there's this theme and most of those films well besides Soul Recall being about With 10 this, years earlier there's mostly the idea too of like where the fuck are we like I yeah. get the basics of what's happening but it's you know and it doesn't really abandon it but you're still there's always something off that's happening in a scene just the sense of reality it's I mean there's a certain point while watching where I'm just like okay no this is it, it's very surreal right when you know you find a, cunt, a local country gas station is just yeah called local country, country, country gas, gas station, gas station. Like, okay and it's meant to be played as humor it's like you know th- the way i connected this was like okay this is sort of like a yorgos lathamos flick you know something like the lobster killing of a sacred deer where it's just it's a like, completely surreal reality and you just go with it and whatever it's going to throw at you you shouldn't be surprised by it there's a reason why the performances are being delivered a certain way why the sense of humor is just off and I was just on board going, you know, I'm just going to see where this goes and hope that it delivers. It's like, screw the name of the gas station. The Willem Dafoe's character, the gas man's yeah, name is gas. gas. <laughs> like, it, it's, it, it's, it's whims. It's like, you know, the playing with, with the little amphibian reptile thing. If that, because it, it totally doesn't hold up now, even though the, the, the creature effects, you know, it looks organic like the biopods and the, and the cords and the other amphibian stuff later on. Um, but that was definitely on purpose. You know, you're, you're in this very realistic world, despite, you know, the technology being far past what we had then, or even today with how far virtual reality has come just since Mm -hmm. we've stopped doing the podcast, you know, that if you didn't throw that little dragon thing in there, there was no sense of you knowing for sure, for sure that this is a little bit of a fantasy. And that's when it kind of starts tipping its hat, you know, like you said, with the quote unquote country gas station, and yeah. gas and this dragon where you go maybe this isn't it's real. it's one of those things where it's like in the back of my mind i was like yeah but i don't want to act like a know-it-all and be like oh it, of course it's not going to be real because there's also i took the red it, it, it it's one of those things where you know there's those allusions to the ski lodge and then they're just like come on nobody skis you anymore skiing? you know that so this is more like the not too distant future and i guess just the idea where people sort of abandon reality and just accept complete unreality that that might be just the mindset where even gas is like oh you changed my life and i love the the questionnaire that comes right after that when jude Lott or pinkle um you know asks him he's like you said that allegra you know changed your your world why are you still working here and he's like what kind of fucking dumbass question is that like <laughs> i'm not here always you know yeah, and he's like clearly oh, yeah. this guy's never played a game before well, it's like beyond, I love the fact that they just call it a game here, that there's no other terminology. They don't call it jacking in or virtual Second reality. Second life wasn't or, a thing yet. Well, even if it was, you know, it, it's just a game. Because ultimately, it is what it is. You know, it's an alternate reality, a virtual reality. But technically, there's a game that they go into and there's a narrative and they have to embrace certain lines of dialogue and do certain things out of their control just to keep moving forward. Mm-hmm. Like, they have Which to is, let themselves be driven. So the the freedom of choice of doing whatever the hell you want in this virtual or t- otherworldly scape, it's not really there. So I get, game is probably the best thing that you can call it. Jennifer Jason Leigh's character, she actually has, like, a great quip for that, where, you know, because Jude Law's gone, oh, like, this isn't real. Like, the, the free will is kind of fake. Like, you know, I don't, I'm not really buying it. And he's like, why do I have to say that? And she goes, well, like, in the real world, we don't really have free will either. And it's true, you know. You work in the customer service industry. I do. There's a certain um, leash that you're on. You might not have a script per se. But in your head, you got an automatic script that you uh-huh. go by when someone comes it's, in. It's like, how free are you? You know, you still have to say hello. You got to ask them this. You got to put on certain pleasantries. And even if you're a total dick, um, you have to do it within reason, you know. But you are doing it because you want to. You're not letting yourself be driven necessarily. Like, you can stop th- that program or that Mm-hmm. Or whatever you want to call it, any any second you want, it's just there are consequences for doing so. It happened to me, you know. Today I was amped up on ca- uh, caffeine, had a coffee right when my morning started, which is very rare for me. And 
yeah, no, I started having genuine interactions uh, with people that were coming into my place of business because I wanted to, not because I had to, but I was enjoying the conversation, you know? And it's not every day that something like that happens, and maybe it's because I saw this film last night and other reasons, too. I jacked into something not virtual. And, uh, yeah, people no, People need was, people, man. And I, that, <laughs> I mean that in many ways. Oh, yeah. I was kind of reluctant to watch this last night. You know, I had just gotten off work. I knew that I had to. I didn't have the time today to do it. And sure enough, one of the first things I got I did when I got home last night besides eat was play some video games. And it wasn't anything serious. It was some Pac-Man and, you know, some Tetris and stuff. You know, some, like, pick up and play like arcade type experiences for me watching something like this now like i said even though um i didn't really forget any of it it all seems so familiar still is just kind of the beauty like you said that it's so accurate to what we're going on and not just in terms of a uh like cell phone or what's going on in the real world versus the the fake world that we perceive but, you know, virtual reality, you know, is, is still not where I thought it would be or anyone thought it would be. But the technology is still good enough where if I am doing a certain game or experience or whatever for a certain amount of time, that there's this moment, this very scary and unsettling moment when you take the damn thing off where you have to go, oh, shit, I'm still here. I'm not where I was anymore. And there's nothing else like it on the planet. It is a very weird experience. It's kind of like when you're at the movies during the day and it's bright outside and you're in the theater for two, three hours and you walk mm -hmm. out, it's still bright and you're like, oh, fuck, it's still daytime. Yeah. It's one of those. Those sensations that I have where it's like, I feel like I'm still, to, to some extent, I'm still in the movie. You know, it's like when you mm -hmm. walk out of the dark night after being in there for two and a half hours, and then for like about 20 minutes, the outside world feels a little bit more epic because you still get that score going in your head. Or There's Aquaman. There's a sense of urgency to go. But Aquaman, too, I did not see it yet. I haven't had Go see time. it, man. Uh, if I see it. a Terrence Malick movie, then, you know, the world's a little bit more slower. It's like every single time I hear the wind just brush against like trees mm -hmm. that's a little bit more heightened for me like whatever sensations that you get from whatever movie you see in a theater it sticks with you because you still have to adjust back to reality for 2018 i think the the three big ones for me were sorry to bother you um <laughs> fucking unfriended dark web and uh whatchamacallit oh, i'm missing it the 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 ramsey film um, you were never really here yeah those three, when I left, you know, just the sense of let me reprocess. I got to restructure my brain really fast. What am I doing? Let me look. Oh, look at that tree. Oh, that's cool. Oh, there's someone in that car um, where it, it it's kind of, you know, it's the same for most media. You finished a book, and if it's a certain kind of read, you just you kind of sit there with like a refractory period, you know. One of the most obvious ones, too, is just music. You know, you listen to a song for three mm -hmm. minutes, and then when you leave, it can still stick with you and echo in your head while you're doing whatever it is that you're doing. Even if the song's like two decades old, like she cares whenever we're never, yeah. which I felt like listening to a couple of days ago is like, why the fuck do I want to hear that song? And I listen to it and now it's in my head again. The song's <laughs> catchy. That should be on the beginning. It's like, don't call it a comeback. It's wherever, whenever on your, on your I already started, man. I, there's a close. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll be I'll be curious about that, because um, it's what's interesting about this film is this is his last truly original screenplay. Everything post video drums besides this film has been an adaptation or based on some kind of true story. Um, and even if he does have a screenwriting credit like he does on Cosmopolis, well, it's like well that's Dom DeLillo's book. You know, it's not actually his story. Uh, where maybe he doesn't want to do that kind of thing anymore. Maybe he he doesn't um, have the voice that he used to because he's so busy, you know, it's producing the films actually... with his wife and doing this and and funding and the international lifestyle and I, who knows what it is. But literally, his last two fully written films are Videodrome and this film. And it, there's there's more than just sinew and you know, like whatever kind of conjoining them like that um where if if i don't know like maybe there's a double feature that someone will throw eventually and i'll suffer now, through video drum again well, yeah I, I mean this got me also curious to just check out cosmopolis again and i'm not entirely sure why specifically maybe just mm -hmm. it's a there weird might, movie i mean it's it's a weird movie that i barely remember yeah. and i'm not even sure if like tonally or, or 
it might be even close to this. I remember Paul Giamatti just, being in that in a really weird role. And just the whole limo driver thing with, like, the apocalypse going on was just so strange. Um, more I mean, inclined more myself. to, like, uh, Occupy Wall Street and stuff like that. Something like that. Like, yeah. I, I'm more inclined personally to see Maps of the Stars again. I really liked uh, a lot about that film. Just it's... Um, the, it's a satirical view on celebrity culture and how tourists like view, you know, the where Hollywood or the movies are made. Um, especially as someone who's not exactly ever been in the studio system, not not even with the fly. And speaking of, I I, I don't know if you saw it on the interwebs, but there's like this. Um, it's hard to even explain what it is, but it's essentially, or it was because it's over, like a art exhibit pop up shop. Uh, called Slashback Video, where the idea was it's like a late 80s, early 90s video rental shop uh, with the actual tapes on display, but, you know, you don't pick them up because they're quote-unquote art and other things, too. Um, They did have this picture I took of uh, a fly poster, and it was really, really kick-ass. It was was beat up and had some tape on the corners and some holes and stuff, and it it wasn't like a one-sheet for the theater, though. This was something else, or maybe it it was, but I I couldn't tell. I was like, I'd buy that for forty bucks. Like, <laughs> just one of those. Uh, I'll so send how you. How much a, it was? I don't. It wasn't for sale. You know, this is, this yeah. is literally. It's like I was in a museum type idea. But it you was at the buy museum. It afterwards, it didn't have anything like no, that. No, no. I did buy a uh, an so actual. How much is this piece going for? Twelve hundred dollars. <laughs> okay, they had some stuff no, for sale. No. Actually, they they truly did. Um, that was it's probably cool. pricey though. But yeah, it was mostly pricey. Uh, but I did get like a little one sheet that I'll, I'll put up on my wall. Uh, it was a fun experience, like I said. I, I got to post those pictures on the internet, and uh, it's actually funny because uh, br- you know Brandon from Scream One Hundred One podcast. Um, he also went once or twice, and he bought the T-shirt. Um, so for Halloween this past year, because I actually random like life coincidence, funny moments, like I stumbled into his place of business. So, and yeah, he went to work as like a slashback video, co- uh, you know, clerk. Um, it was funny seeing that image on, on the Twitters or inner Instagram, wherever it was. Um, it was a fun little LA, let me drive all the way out to Burbank to see this thing on the day it closes type thing in the pouring rain too. It was really r- raining that day, like about a week ago. But yeah, this is one of those movies where I really wish I had not a DVD copy, but a VHS copy. I just do like for this one. Like, I don't, I don't know. Just. Even though I've already seen this two or maybe three times now, who's who's as hell? I, I can't remember, especially because it kind of folds into itself in the final 30, 25 minutes, whatever it is. Um, where even though I knew where it was going, I was having a hard time following. I had to kind of like narrate or uh, do like quick game recap um, for uh, my co-viewer. Uh, during our screening, and so I was like, "Oh, this happened, and then this <laughs> happened, and then you didn't catch the trout farm." Like, see, like they're they're processing these amphibians for their parts, so the parts can be used to make the game pods. But then down the river, they actually serve the fish. But then those those fish are actually, you know, th- that then there's the gun, and I don't know. If I it's can't really explain how that or works. If it's but, just incredibly but, <laughs> convoluted as it keeps going. Like maybe if I were to watch it again, that could be I could not really put two and two together now. Uh-huh. Like, like I said, I, I, I don't know because it's like there's a lot of uh, just the idea of like the the game pods being like uh, they talk about how they're they're kind of like animals they're grown yeah. from eggs and it's and it's dependent on human energy to work like you know that was an interesting idea and then it, it gets to the thing with the fish and then everybody's just shooting everybody and i'm once I'm like, they go into the game within the game once they they go to that like gag shop right yeah i'm kind of scared for this kind of shit like you know if especially if you know the forget a dream within a dream you know that's child's play how about you you go into some game or virtual reality or Jack Biopod, and then when you're in that one, you go into another one, and then from that one, you go into another one, and then yeah, another like one. The, you know the way that they transition from game to game. I mean, uh-huh. like right when Existence like pauses uh, at the restaurant. Existence is pause. Yeah, I know, and then he just drops onto the table, which I get is the mattress. It's like mm-hmm. the, you know those transitions. How it's more or less like half of the set. Just well, kind of bridging he, into another one. There's no CGI play or anything happening. All that stuff is really cool, and it's really off-putting though when it just cuts to a different place like that, kind of halfway because you're not seeing some slow digital transition. It's more like 
okay, here's this, now you're back here. It's like, it's weird and it's jarring, but it's incredibly effective. I don't know. It's just, I, I think it's one of those rides where it doesn't matter how good it is, it's never as good as the first time. Even still, I, I think there's some kind of beauty to a film like this where it doesn't matter who you show it to, they're going to give you some kind of reaction, whether it's love it or hate it. Where, you, you know me with like the art cinema bias where I do not like the ambiguous ending. And sure enough, you know, you do get one here. But it's not, so not ambiguous because I think you get the meaning. It's just you get the meaning, but to, I mean, you're able to leave the story at that point. You don't need you're um, left with the philosophical question that you don't have an answer to. Even without you know the technological parallels between this and and uh, the Matrix, just the you know the red blue bill, a blue pill, like which side of the rabbit hole are you on, like rea- like Zionists versus um, uh, the agents, like these kinds of philosophical debates that are going on in that film that are also very present here just at a a different kind of level like guerrilla warfare level versus like all out war where it's like it's only like 15 minutes of this film and it happens so fast even in a rewatch where you're like what the fuck is going on where when you finally are kind of uh, taken out of it a little bit like everyone on screen is also talking about like I kind of got confused at the end what was going on with this what was going on like that it's like that on purpose and that purpose isn't exactly known to me but I think maybe it's just to kind of cement the the nauseous feeling of not knowing which reality is which. Where I think it also it it kind of just takes this uh, sort of strange stance. I, I think more just like on addiction in general, where mm-hmm. you know it it's kind of just treating gaming. Or I think just like where on all these levels, it's more critical of it's pretty nihilistic on how it's looking at where society is moving forward. Because I mean, there's just there's those dumb moments like you know the thing with the disease pod you know you look at it and you're just like oh you shouldn't plug into that but jennifer jason lee is like i i want to do it and I you have know to. that's a bad idea and that's something where you know just that I'm addict mentality of like you're doing something that you know is really bad for you and it's just you know like we kind of all have that in small doses of like oh you know i should stop watching youtube like uh, all right i'm just gonna watch yeah. one one turns into 20 dumb shit like that uh, and then there's more serious ones of like, okay, just one more drink, and then I'm done, and one drink turns into 20. But, <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, it's like, that's, I'm still not sure what to make of it, because it's, you know, as far as like gaming and all that tech, it, it comes across as like, or it's it's basically presented as more biological, and how more intimate just the experience becomes for people, and it's... Uh, just I took it just as more of a surreal expression of that until it gets like more tech savvy near the end and it begins to make sense. But um, geez, I I don't know if I'm going on a rant here, but um, you get what I'm saying? It's like it. No, yeah, totally. It's like yeah, I said, it's, it's it's close cousins to Videodrome, like just that how this technological piece of of knowledge or content or whatever is then hybridized or kind of like uh fused together with the organic self and you know your worst nightmares coming to be like it here you know with the the injured or decaying or diseased or spore filled game pods and oh your bioports fucked up oh like your neurosurge like oh you like you did this where it's there's constantly an excuse being made to Mm -hmm. just get back into the game no matter what their reality is that's happening which is oh they're marked for death and they're being chased hey let's go to a hotel and play that's what i want to do right now well if you like go there's reasons justified throughout because she's like i want to make sure my game's okay but it, you know, it's like it does come across at first of like, oh, you know, just a careless like, oh, you know, there's nothing mm-hmm. happening in reality right now. So let's just do this. Or if you, you know, go through his entire career, I think that's why it's so interesting, you know, besides his more acclaimed current films where, you know, it, you got addicted to games, addicted to TV and movies, um, addicted to science and, you know, like uh, crossing the unknown. Um, mm-hmm. But then if you like go back to like his first breakout you know before scanners like you go to shivers no rabbit excuse me um where it's literally just about a venereal disease that like turns people into quote-unquote zombies where you know he, he's always you know he created for lack of a better word and maybe arguably and truly did create 
uh, the you know the body horror idea that you know we are our our worst enemy like we are our, our it all worst leads nightmare. to self destruction at some point mm-hmm. I don't know I I think that this this is one of those movies where the less you say about it the better like you don't tell anyone why it's cool you just say oh man like do you do you like David Cronenberg you in a trippy shit you should check this one out and that's enough I think like a lot my... of it also just hinges on the ending which we can just get into now yeah. because you're going along with the ride and then once it gets to those final five minutes you're just like holy fucking shit like split i mean you know which right off the bat you know you talk about how you take off a vr headset and you're adjusting to reality there's that sensation here when they're like out of the game and then they're all reflecting on it and it's there's a sense of relief and also joy because they're kind of just laughing about how like i i don't know i keep imagining that this had negative reviews when it came out because it's been forgotten and that's i didn't even bother to look it up but that's just the assumption i made Ebert and gave it three stars he compared it favorably against the matrix he said that this does things that the matrix didn't do as well yeah i and mean he, they both were completely different too i mean just the, the matrix yeah. was it's a fucking action movie of course and you know it was revolutionary for other reasons this is very just much forward thinking and i can see why it's definitely going to play a lot better now um it's definitely worth a look now you know because just in a modern context it plays incredibly well even just the reality, like, it's scary how close it is to now. You know, I brought up the cell phones. Um, y- yeah, just the tablets and um, all that stuff. I, I Fuck that. It, go, go back further. This is pre-2000. Uh, this is pre-9-11. Yeah. And you have this event um, before, you know, active shooting was a thing. And you have to have Jude Law there with his security, you know, a gun to make sure that, you know, people aren't bringing in, you know, he says, you know, it's for uh, electronic devices. So people aren't recording this stuff. Like you'd be surprised what piracy can do. And it's like, no, like it was actually about a gun. And what's this person have? He has an organic gun uh, that you can't trace with, you know, some kind of uh, security bypass system. Like, I don't know, like a 3d printed gun perhaps. And, you know, throughout the fact that it's made from bones and fish guts and it shoots teeth, which by the way, that that is such a cool detail. Like, it's weird, but that gun is such a cool prop. The fact that you get to see them make it, too. Or the fact that the dog that carries it away also is the same dog that is carrying the guns when you get to the quote-unquote reality that the film is set in. Which, by the um, way, if dogs pass through security, or I, I don't know, how does that work? Do they go through the same crap? I mean, because I'm assuming since I got, in I got that no church you don't, you don't see them going through some, so they're easily able to sneak that in. But, you know, something that just... For me, I know that this wasn't the intent, but mm-hmm. the shooting at the end, like the, the very, very end, after they kill them and they're on their way out the door, I just got a big like Charlestown uh, church shooting <laughs> reminder because they go up to a person of color and they point their gun at them, and right then I was wait, just, don't don't shoot me, yeah, we're no, still in the yeah, game, right? Yeah, and then he and he basically just goes like, is this is this real or yeah, are we still in the game? I know that's not the intent, but that just echoed that along with their reactions of everybody else they're just sitting there looking at their phones and they're not reacting immediately just something that what's funny i I guess has always been a thing but you know it it reminded me of also there was a movie about um a couple weeks before christmas that i saw and the fire alarm did go off uh the dcp was still going though it like took a few seconds to not go and i was ready to get up and go but people were still just kind of like uh, sitting down a little confused because there was a voice saying to evacuate, but it was really faint, and the DCP was still going at the same time while this annoying light was flashing. And I was like, yeah, yeah can we go? But, like, people were just kind of, like, slowly moseying their way on out, and it, it's like the lack of uh, urgency when something serious happens. People just take a while to process it. You know what I mean? I just you That's know, I something to... I brought to that when they were just kind of like still on their phones, just sitting there after the two uh, uh, gaming heads just got shot. Like no one reacted. No, they were. That's not true. I, I think that's uh, a, a week later. Your, your memory being a little hazy. Um, no, they're, they're on there. Like, no, their, their... no, I remember that specifically. Like they were just sitting there looking. They're in shock, but uh, well, you know, when they get out and everyone, you know, they do the the round robin. And everyone's talking like, oh, like yeah. you know, Jude Law is like, oh, my accent sucks. So if you guys can tell we're in a relationship, <laughs> the guy is yeah. like, oh, I, you know, Eccleston, you know, was he like the the ninth Doctor or whatever? Um, right before he did that, where he's like, well, I was barely in it, and this guy's like, oh, I hated my accent, and this guy was like, oh, this, like, it got confusing. 
And then, yeah, sure enough, they're all on their phones. They're probably, like, posting about what they just read or what they just experienced. And then, yeah, yeah once they get gunned down, they are kind of Which just that, sitting there. Which you would do that today, and that, that's insane how forward-thinking that is for Well, this. They, they wouldn't just be sitting there. They'd be posting about recording it um, or whatever. Like, just yesterday I was watching some. I don't know if it was Kazakhstan or where, but it was, it was definitely one of those where um, these guys in a shop – uh, are like prepping a pepper spray and some guy comes in with like a full on like musket shotgun you know like the super long double barrel um and they they subdue him with the pepper spray and you know he's got like the the slavic text on and everything um where even though that was shot from the security camera that it wouldn't be too out of the norm for someone to be there i'm sure one of them has their cell phone footage of the same event where you can see just the most fucking bonkers shit on the internet now, um, and it you know it's all for the the celebrity. Like it's all for the mm-hmm. sake of not even fifteen minutes because you don't even get that anymore. Those fifteen seconds of fame, like an Instagram story, is like what like nine seconds, and that's enough for a lot of people. Where it's it's just yeah, it's, it's momentary, but then it's you know the next it's one eternal. comes along. It all comes real quick at you. I know it's one of your favorite films of 2018 too, just eighth grade kind of idea Mm -hmm. where it's like, think about the social anxiety that our kids are going to have because they're always on the internet. Like today was the 12th anniversary of the first iPhone. The first iPhone is 12 years old. 2007. Yeah. So if you ever meet a teenager ever again, the chances of them having an iPhone their entire life is astronomically high, which is very scary to think about. No, um, it's it's reality, man. It's real, and we're all gonna have to adjust to that. And it's not like that's the worst. No, thing of course in the not. World. But we'll deal with it in, yeah. in terms of you know our generation being unnecessarily labeled the millennials, where it's like, yeah, that is true. You know, we did uh, mature at the turn of the century. Like the millennium changed when we kind of changed. Yeah, but even generations that grew up without having a cell phone, when it was just landline mm-hmm. phones, they're just as addicted as we are. You know, when Google Maps doesn't work for them, they freak out. Like I, they're, they're I, just as lost and confused as the rest of us. But the millennial idea or, like, the term is so widespread that literally anyone that's, like, between 5 and our age, like, 5 to 35, you're kind of labeled a millennial, right? But the amount of years that we had under our belt, like, pre-smartphone, mm-hmm. creates such a divide there where a film like this probably wouldn't even scare, you know, these 12 or 15-year-olds because they've had the cell phone their whole time, or maybe even, you know, if they are, like, 12 years old, like, half their life they might have been, if they have a well-off family, like, had a virtual reality headset in their house, you know, Um, where it's just, like, you kind of watch this, and they have that Back to the Future moment where it's like, that's a kid's toy! I gotta use my hands! (laughs) And it's it's not too uh, much of, like, I don't know, just uh, ideological leap. The names of the two main games here are Existence and Transcend, or Transcendent, yeah. um, where it's like this idea of the existential crisis or to literally transcend. You know, like they talk about Allegra's other game, um, the one, you know, when Gas is actually talking about art it. God. It was called Art God because you art God, but also you're, you know, a, an artist who's God. Yeah, or like God like, is yeah, an artist by creating. Yeah. You know, and it's so funny, you know, um, where no, I mean, it's, it's like, like it, th- this isn't going to exactly play well for kids, but I think as an adult film, you know, or just an adult piece of sci-fi it. Yeah. Like absolutely. Even now, um, like I've said, just it's maybe it wasn't released at the right time or maybe not enough people would have thought about it. But yeah, at no, this I, point now though, like specifically, I think it was released at the, at the right time, you know, right at the end of the century, like virtual reality was like five, six, seven years old at that point. And, you know, as far it as wasn't being what embraced it is by now. an audience though, like well, I, just, you know, it was, it was a known granted, thing. I, I saw it with a crowd that walked out like just more or less blown away. Like everyone was walking out ecstatic and talking about it. And just just had that high knowing that they had seen some great. And that's, you know, that that really speaks a lot to how good this thing this was. I mean, I don't think it was just the experience Mm -hmm. like uh, I I think I might be right there with you. Like, I love the fly, but this I'm not even going to say just my favorite, but like this is the best Cronenberg flick I've seen because it's 
so freaking dense and thoughtful and it's it's just packed and there See, there's a I'm, meaning to draw from there's an idea to draw from every single scene more or less whether they're talking about it or whether uh, you know there's just a design in the game and how that speaks to gaming culture now or just how technology's evolved and how how we've perceived it and interacted with that and the real world. It's such a, a divide for me, you know, between like favorite and best. And I can say without a doubt that the fly from like a critical standpoint is probably Cronenberg's best film. I think a history of violence is his most accessible. Um, but, you know, so I'd say the fly is the most accessible. No the way. Premise is, it's simple. No it's a, way. Are you it's joking? It's a simple, high concept premise. Like you got, it, it's, you got it's a scientist violent. turning into a fly. You yeah. got to watch him break someone's arm. Yeah. It 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 is not like the story is accessible, but that's just what I terms, mean. Like just the concept, it's it's like, easier to sell. Whereas like a history of violence, uh -uh. I think even that movie was marketed as something that it wasn't entirely. It's it's a weird escape the mob family drama, sure, but you know there there's like nothing there that's out and weird and zany or or better yet scary. Like there's barely even any violence in it, and it's you know. Well, I mean, the fly is Cronen that movie where Cronenberg is playing to his uh, strengths, and it's easy to sell to an, or it's easier to sell to an audience, whether or not they can stomach it. That's the it, question. It's most of his films, you know. The question, like pre two thousand, you know, it ended with this one, where it's like, oh, like, am I gonna like that? Where after this came out, I was like, oh no, this is different Cronenberg, different filmmaker, different kind of films. Like he's really adult now; he doesn't need that shock value. But, you know, I, I I have a very special place in my heart for, for The Fly, and I think it's because it has a very traditional narrative, and it's a, a, a monster and um, and his love interest film, and, uh, you know, so many things, you know, so many things, and I don't want to talk about because we already talked about it before. They can they can go listen to that shit. Back in a world where, where a screening like this was impossible. It, eh? It's, it, it, but, it, it, you and know. here just, we are two years later. It's It's a scale for me where it's like, I don't know. It's like I think this is his, my favorite of his, without a doubt. But I think The Fly is still his masterpiece. Well, but... someone asked about Cronenberg. Like I'll always point to The Fly right away. Of like, yeah, you know, g give this a shot. You'll dig yeah. this. And then if the conversation digs deeper, I'll be like, well, you know, th there's one I like a little bit more. <laughs> there's this thing called Existence, which, y you know, okay, it it's it's a tough sell. I don't know if you'll no, be into it. Don't even it. sell it. Like I I didn't even try to sell this to my date. Like, she knew. She knew that, you know, the podcast was going to get another episode. I told her that it was happening, but I didn't I didn't attempt to fucking tell her. She's like, oh, tell me about it. I was like, no, it's not one of those. And yeah, so we're on Someone Hulu. has to ask you questions about it. Like, you can't really push this on anybody. You, like, I think that this is definitely just one of those films, like, in, in much in the same way of The Matrix, you know, where if you don't know anything or Fight Club, you don't know anything going mm -hmm. in and you kind of tip your toes into it. It, it's going to hook you in such a way that if you knew anything, it's going to ruin it for you. Like, you don't want to know, like, Tyler Durden and, and the rules of Fight Club. You don't want to know that shit. Like, yeah, they, you don't want to know how The Matrix works. Yeah. You don't want to. What, what's wanna, real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which you I don't, don't even think the marketing for those movies showed what the real world was at all. Uh, or for that first one. Yeah, anyway. not for the first one. Definitely not for the first one. It was about the bullet time and I know Kung Fu. And it was just like, what is The Matrix? Yeah. Yeah. That was the big question. If only there was a way to kind of put on your time machine goggles and not know that The Matrix is a trilogy um, plus an animated movie plus multiple video games plus, you know, like theme park attractions type shit and uh, references and, you know, Ready Player One and, and the Lego movie and stuff like that. If you didn't know that, you know, if it was its own thing... Um, like this film, you know, I think this Existence is just one of those lucky cinematic treats, you know, a true debt to cinema. And in people that... could still go into a theater mm -hmm. two weeks ago, or a week ago, not no, knowing for, a thing like, about it and just discovering it. This is this is one of those gems, like beyond just a hidden gem, but gem period where it will never be clamored for or like have like a very loud audience. Like I said, the Amy Nicholson um, uh, piece earlier that I mentioned she actually writes about fucking movies. Like, you know, big Twitter personality for movies. She didn't even mention this film. And Cronenberg isn't a nobody. Like, most people that know anything about cinema know the name, at least. Or, you know, they know The Fly or History of Violence or Eastern Promises. You know, he's a known guy. 
he was not mentioned about, you know, like the pinnacle of modern filmmaking in 1999, um, where it's just, this is one of those, you know, he is one of those where he's a master, you know, like he knows what he's trying to do. Maybe it's not perfect, you know, like this, this thing really fucks with you and it's supposed to fuck with you, you know, it's a most, uh, it's one of those films that I'll always think about, even if I don't think about it always. <laughs> Like, it's just a beauty to its insanity. It's the tipping point for art cinema for me. Like, it, it's got one leg in, oh, this is really artsy. And then it's got another leg in, nah, this is for everyone. They just don't know it. And it, it, there's that divide there. You know, it's like a David Lynch type thing where it's like, oh, well, some of his film, films can be for everyone, but not necessarily. You know, like, look there's at the popularity. There's that thing here, too, where it'll, mm-hmm. it'll definitely lose you about a little after halfway as it gets messy, yeah. but you're still sticking with it and you still follow the basics. And then when it all wraps up, you get it essentially. Even if you, it wasn't there a hundred percent of the way it never or you don't shot know, itself in the foot. You don't know if you actually get well, it. But I mean, and even then I don't, it's something where, you know, in the world of the game, there's so much thrown at them that I is supposed to serve, I think, as more of a distraction that even they're not supposed to fully get it, and they're still focused on what they're doing. Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push very hard for this. Um, this is on Hulu, right the fuck now. Like, anyone that has a Hulu membership can watch this commercial free for as low as, you know, seven ninety nine a month or whatever. Maybe there's, like, cheaper memberships you can get. And it's one of those, like... You know how Netflix will release some film like Bird Box or whatever, and it's all that the internet talks about for like maybe two, three days max. Yeah, cause or it's if it's like, like a, a it, yeah, it was the same thing with um, I forgot the a, a Bandersnatch, the Black Mirror. Interactive yeah, no, thing. no one cares yeah. about that now, you know. But like, you know, if it's a bigger film like Spider Verse, where people won't shut up about it for like a week or two, um, where. I feel very strong about the fact, and, you know, this is kind of, like, why we did Debt to Cinema in the first place, I want to say, that if the right person or right people pushed the right people, that this is the kind of film that could definitely have one of those 24-hour news cycles, where they go, did you know 20 years ago that David Cronenberg made this film? And, like, it would take not even, like, the, the top of the food chain. Like, it wouldn't need to be, you know, like, Palmer Lucky, like, tweeting about something like that. It could be anyone. They don't even have to be in the tech or film industry. Just, like, someone who who has some kind of web uh, following that, you know, if you recorded, like, still, um, like, moments of this film on your phone and put them on your fucking Instagram, that, like, it, mm-hmm. it could go viral. Uh, where it's like, what the fuck did you just watch, you know? You yeah, know, this will still get attention every once in a while for sure. Maybe. but We, it, might, we might hit just one person <laughs> with this, and it'll be worth it. I, it definitely would be worth it for me. I mean, I, I, that's what I, I like to think about in passing, you know, and think about, you know, I, we used to complain about, wow, why doesn't anyone fucking comment on our stuff, or why didn't we get this? And then I also the, don't think we were very good marketers either. We, well, we weren't bad, but it big, definitely it could have could have done more, you know. Um, but then over time, when we did get those comments and the, those people and, you know, those fans and those Patreon supporters and, um, you know, uh, guests and stuff like that, like over time where it was only really about one person. And, and since we stopped doing the show, you know, I'm sure a lot's happened in your life and a lot's definitely happened in mine. Um, we're like time to just reflect and to contemplate and, and whatnot. But just the fact that, yeah, just like, you know, one person, like I started listening to podcasts really kind of for the first time in my life after we started doing the show and like like I mentioned earlier that heavily pixelated show like that's not meant for a big big audience and you know if I'm like playing a video game or exercising or whatever and I listen to that or maybe like just hanging out with my cat or whatever um, just for those 20 to 40 minutes or whatever it is where you just you're like oh I'm not alone you know and it's great too you know if it's like some kind of review or something or they're talking about something that you like or maybe it's some kind of like deep sea diving through like filmic history or something like that like if you haven't ever listened to you must remember this you got to like a yeah I, the Karina Longworth thing yeah no yeah the episode that I heard the other day was um Lillian Gish the original it girl which is like something that I actually learned about when I took that women's um, studies class the and back in film school like I knew who she was I knew who the original that girl was and I listened to like 
two hours of who she was and her life and her film career and her family and her husband's and it's like yeah you know Claire Bogue who excuse me not Lillian Gish that was the one before her um, but you know it was it, in Wings it, yeah the love interest in Wings yeah. exactly yeah. you know like she was the hottest hottie in the of the silent era like not even, no one was even close it was her and like listening to her life story um, where you know it's not anything like the podcast that we did and at the same time it's like one person there's still i don't know some kind of magic about radio or the the spoken word that even five seconds of listening to this is very different from reading anything for five hours even um and i don't know what that is and i don't know if, if we're gonna do it again but i i think it's safe to say that uh anyone that's probably ever seen this thing would buy this shit like it's uh, absolutely right there. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, for, I forgot we had a rating system that's right there's, there's, films like that's this don't need for, a rating man. system <laughs> They're too good for that. Like, I, no, but I mean, it. You know, I I'm glad that I was able to prove you wrong because I was pretty confident that this could have a screening, uh, w- which it did. And not only that, it had a screening where people walked out. It's ecstatic. It happened a week ago. It'll happen again. I was listening to um, Polly Shore on the Joe Rogan podcast. I really hope that Biodome gets some kind of resurgence in popularity. Freddie got um, fingered played in a theater too, like a, well, see, a year or two ago, and that's I'm, one I'm of those. Sure, it was a crowd that liked it. So why wouldn't Biodome? I just fucking uh, love. I know you so do, man. Biodome, man. Yeah. Like, li- just listening to him lament. If the I fact get a that... screening of Toy Soldiers with a crowd that's <laughs> ecstatic. I'll be fucking happy. Listening to Polly Shore lament the fact that he's not famous anymore, like he was like fucking. I love Adam Sandler, but I was just in Stanley Wexler, and like it's kind of sad to think about, you know. Um, I was like, yeah, feel you, Polly, feel you. <laughs> yeah, his star's come and gone, but even yeah. still, where it's just like, I don't know. Like when I when I think back on it, like the 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 films that we kind of threw at each other on the show. Um, only a couple of regrets, but not not a little, not not well, many. Like across. Uh, I'd have to look at the whole fucking list to be honest. I got no regrets. I'm just kind of like, yeah, no, I'll not, throw not whatever, re- whatever, not whatever regrets I can my necessarily, way, yeah, but, but just like, um, maybe it's just you know like the conversation went like somewhere where like you know it wasn't it wasn't as good as the film deserved. There's like some West, that it, well, yeah, no, like I West Side mean, Story. You were drunk for West Side Story, you know? No, was I? <laughs> yeah, you recorded that drunk. Yeah, I. Or maybe. I had, I know I loved the movie, <laughs> and I wasn't drunk for that. No, I um, I, I got that on DVD recently, where it's yeah. like a little box also, set you with you like didn't a, watch with it, a script though, in it. I did it. That, yeah, I didn't have to. I'm not gonna say that's why, but maybe I didn't have to though. Like, it, no, I, it, hey, hey there, there's just there's some where you're feeling them, and then there's some where it's just kind of like, all right, it's another one that can, but you just keep going till next time. It's like RoboCop three, man. I made you watch yeah. that shit. You know that was rough. I had the worst yeah. recording time recording that because it kept that was I was just not in a good space literally. That was just uh... there was like internet problems. And I think it was just you and Tyler and I like kept cutting in and out and I tried to like pretend like I was in the room the whole time <laughs> and I probably said some that made no sense. Oh, uh, f- fun fun memories, bad times in the moment. He's kind of made it. He lives out here now. He's like yeah time podcaster producer. Yeah, like. He started a new show about uh, like movie soundtracks and original songs for like the late '90s, early 2000s, with like you know Smash nice. Mouth Shrek being like I think the first episode. Um, <laughs> we're like you know, I'll hit him up eventually. Like you know, I could get to him in probably less than an hour by just you know on the metro. Or it'd be, it'd be fun. I don't know. Maybe. Who knows? I don't know. It just takes a conversation on the internet and like, hey, let's grab a beer or something. Maybe. Yeah. No, but hey, as far as this, I mean, yeah, you know, I'm glad I could knock this in the can. I, you know, I'm sure it'll happen again with something. I'm not gonna make any promises <laughs> or anything. But I mean, every once in a while, at where things are right now, don't mind, you know, squeezing out a few little leftovers. You know what I mean? Yeah. Thanks for listening. We hope it's been a pleasure. If you enjoyed this episode, you can listen to more by checking out the Dollar Review Show, where we cover theatrical and streaming releases, as well as give our two cents on anything we sought out on our own, whether that be TV, music, etc. You can find all of our content at dollarreviews.net. Follow us on Twitter or like us on Facebook at Dollar Reviews. And we're also on Google Play Music, iTunes, Pocket Cast, TuneIn, Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, just about anywhere on the internet with hours of content available to you for free. But for those of you that feel that the show is worth your dollar, you can send us a donation at patreon.com slash dollarreviews. 
Contributions not only earn our undying love, but they also make it possible for us to improve our recording equipment and to give you the highest quality episodes possible. But more importantly, they'd be helping us acquire the content to review. You know, trips to the multiplex are expensive, and the more donations we receive, the more films we can review for your listening pleasure. If you listen somewhere we're currently not available, you'd like to contribute some talking points, send a death to cinema request, or if you just want to laugh at us, you can do so by reaching out to us on social media or send an email to brian at dollarreviews.net. Or you can email me as well, steve at dollarreviews.net. You can follow me personally on Twitter at Brian Gillis, that's B-R-Y-O-N-G-I-L-L-I-S, and now you know how to spell the email too, and also under the same name on the Love You site Letterbox, which acts as my film diary, where rate films that I'm watching, write the occasional review, and even sometimes compile lists. You can also find me on Twitter at S underscore MTX, and also follow my film diary at Letterbox under the same name where I log everything I watch, and sometimes write brief reviews. That's it for this week. Until next time, keep the change. <laughs>